Thanks again for the introduction. I am David Rusting. I am the uh, Director of Enterprise Security Initiatives for Unisys. And what that means is I am uh, manage our uh, design and delivery practice, which deals with identity management, security advisory services, security event management, that sort of thing. And uh, I'm very glad I could come here today to talk with you. I'm very happy people actually took the time instead of going out to the beautiful weather we're having uh, this afternoon. And, coming in a nice little room and hear about virtual directory. I did have one question. Did anybody win anything at the uh, the raffle at the end of the, the <laughs> show? <laughs> so a couple things here. So yeah, somebody won a Wii and something else. So I saw Phil Becker downstairs and I asked him, you know, there was one critical thing at this conference that I didn't see raffled off. And he asked me what that was and I said, a power strip. <laughs> and uh, anybody who's been here is, you know, I, I saw people trying to plug into phone jacks and 220 volt. Uh, it, it was just incredible. So uh, those power strips are also very nice. But anyway, um, uh, a little overview of what I'll talk about today. And again, at any time, I want this to be interactive. So please just ask your questions and we'll, I'll answer them as best I can. If they need to go offline, we'll just uh, take them offline. So I'll give you a little bit of a project background uh, of what the work we did at uh, California State Automobile Association, uh, why a virtual directory was one of the components they chose, uh, our implementation experience, a little bit of the if I knew then what I knew now, kind of uh, lessons learned, and some parting thoughts. So a little bit of background about uh, CSAA as we refer to it. It's California State Automobile Association. It's a large membership-based services company. If you're in the U.S., you know about AAAs all around the country. These are the guys that come and do roadside service or auto club services for you. Um, some of them are, however, very large because they provide insurance services. So essentially, you can see this, look at this as an insurance company. And they serve Northern California, Nevada, Utah. They partner with other clubs across the U.S. Um, about $2.3 in revenue, 4 million members, and about uh, 9,000 staff. And you can see a third of them are contractors, which is always a, an interesting mix when you have an employee a contractor populations of about a third of your full po population. Unisys, um, I'm sure the Google search would do a, better, do a better job, although if you did a Google search, you'd probably find all sorts of fun, exciting, interesting articles. But we're a uh, global provider of business operations and information services. Uh, we do have a technology component of servers, but that's really it's probably about 15% of our business. Most of it is uh, uh, consulting services or operation services, outsourcing services, et cetera. And we were brought in a couple years back to do an identity access management roadmap for CSAA. And the challenge they had run into is they had done a, an SSO implementation, which was really more of an application-specific SSO implementation, and uh, it was painful. And they knew they had a lot of needs, and they wanted to figure out well, what should we do based on my environment and what we have going on? What's the kind of roadmap or the path we should take in order to uh, address not only this SSO issue, but you know, what's the other challenges they were facing? So out of that, it was kind of like the proverbial box of chocolates, right? You don't know what you're going to get. We looked at the, their environment. We talked to a lot of business owners. You know, the possible projects. We, d we actually did all of different these in all different sorts of flavors. So after this uh, discussion, if you want to talk about any of these, th these things in specific, I would be glad to chat at length. Um, but the prioritization is the key thing with this, right? You, can't, you don't have money for everything. And you don't have bu the business drivers sometimes dictate what's really important. So the three initial projects we worked on were an enterprise directory project, um, password management project, and something we called Identity Hub, which was really virtual directory. So why virtual directory? Well, for one piece, it was a foundational component for identity and access management. There was a need for a coalesced view of authoritative information. And it, you know, everybody had their silos, just like you know, every organization does. And it was getting to be a really just a stumbling block to being able to expand their services internally and externally. So they needed to easily provide different slices of that data in a standard manner to applications. And again, the customers really here were the application developers because, again, everybody wants to just build their own directory or, or database and make all their user identities and, and go to town. But again, you could do that about you know, 15, 16 times over a course of a couple of years. You kind of get, get tired of doing it. 
a standard mannered, standard LDAP presentation was the, the way to go. Subsequent projects would rely on this data as well. So they knew there were other organizations and groups coming forward, and for example, in their sales and service organization saying, I need those location attributes, I need that identity information. And so they wanted it, and they didn't want to necessarily go create the, you know, the wheel, build it again themselves. And, you know, what I, we found is that doing a virtual directory implementation is like a microcosm of how your other projects might go. It's small enough that it's not a huge um, disruptor, but at the same time, you kind of get a feel for the, I'll say, the tolerance of your organization for change and how other IAM projects will go. So you do your virtual directory project, and based on how that went, you can, it gives you enough, uh, a little bit of a snapshot of how that organization is going to handle doing SSO or provisioning or federation, et cetera. And it's easy to explain what you're doing, just don't call it virtual directory. And what I mean by that is, we, uh, first of all, everyone's using the VD acronym, which gets you into all sorts of trouble. <laughs> and the second thing is, even when you told them what it was, they like they couldn't. People didn't really understand it. You know, virtual directory. They they want they need something easier. So we tried to use Identity Hub, and that 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 worked. And you know, after we could explain it for a few minutes, people got the idea. But again, the term virtual directory means very little at the business layer or operations layer. And so, just a a note when you're trying to communicate this across those different groups. A couple other things about it, it's um, manageable. And when I say manageable, it's you can scope it and execute it within pretty specific parameters. And what I call spidering, which is when somebody says, oh, I want to add this, and I want to add this, and I want to add this, it's very easy to catch those and see what's, you know, kind of stop them if they're going to impact your schedule or your resources. Uh, the costs are relatively low compared to other IAM initiatives that you might be engaged with. Um, the software and the service, I'm sorry, the software and hardware, it, it, that, that is probably the lowest cost you'll ever run into. Your organizational processes and your working relationships with the different groups, those, that, that is the number one variable factor that will determine the true cost of this project. Uh, it can be highly visible when, or conversely, if you screw up really bad, it's a learning experience and it doesn't affect a lot of people. So it has a little bit of a benefit on that side. And I would say it's security friendly in that it's one way that you can control and provide a controlled access layer to that information and attributes instead of having to monitor uh, auditing on every single data source. You can say, well, we're going to present those controls through the virtual directory and then audit it through, provide, provide just the attributes that you need to or audit based on, on that access to that root uh, set of information. It's a little bit of a, you know, the, the security people like it because you can do lots of auditing. So a little bit about our implementation experience. Um, I'd call us the three R's, you know, research, references, and, and roast, or your bake-off. So, you know, look at the solutions in the marketplace, talk to the references, and then try them out and see what works. Uh, in this case, and again, it depends on your requirements in your organization. So sometimes what works in one place, the requirements are different in another. But in this case, I call caching as king because um, the rating product has a, a uh, persistent cache which allows you to get information even though the data source might not be accessible. And in the AAA environment, consistent access to the data was a challenge and you couldn't guarantee it. And when you can't guarantee it and people are relying on it, you have to have a way to it remediate that. Uh, the management tools were a little more user friendly, so we weren't always going to have the LDAP developer who knew everything they were going to be doing. You need to kind of, we, sometimes we had what I'd call business analysts that were very technical that would need to do it, so the tools were nice. And it was a small company, big touch. And so the, the um, uh, Radiant's not a huge company, but they were very involved and very focused in their approach to AAA, and it was uh, that, that went a long way in helping them uh, go down the path. We actually, even after it was selected, because Unisys, we weren't there to say, go buy this product or that product. We were there to present the options, the pros and cons, and let the, the business decide what they wanted to do. We still went through and did a deeper evaluation between the different products that are out there um, to be, you know, kind of confirm the approach. Because even when you go down a path, it's always good to double check what you're doing, uh, because things do change. 
So a little bit of the uh, initial data sources we dealt with. Again, we dealt with uh, human resources, which was uh, PeopleSoft. I know it's like this Oracle now, but I, it's, it'll be PeopleSoft till I die, I guess. Uh, network, which was the Active Directory. Uh, telecom, which was the help desk, which was a custom written application on top of SQL Server. And security, which was a badging system uh, made by Linnell. Some of you may be familiar with that name. Uh, this was later expanded to include other data sources as parts of other projects. So we did a sales and service extension to this. Um, we also tied into some of the, um, uh, the DMV uh, verification systems they have and so forth. Um, it sounds pretty easy when you, you know, look at it and say, oh, you know, put up your virtual directory, connect your systems, it's boom, you're done, go home, and it's easy. But uh, uh, it's not. It takes be mainly because your organiz it's organization issues, not technical issues. And you know, even though I used the uh, comment about uh, you know, heroes, if you were any of our meetings, a lot of times you might think our favorite show was Deadwood because of the language that was used sometimes, because people were very frustrated with the, the lack of speed that they felt their that the groups were working. You know, you had a lot of, a lot of challenges, uh, inter interpersonal challenges, I should say. <laughs> so um, going back to the data. Uh, Doc Searle had a thing about the Boy Scouts in the, his, his initial presentation, and it, uh, it's a surprise it's, it's, it's there again. You know, you need to be prepared because the data is not where you think it is. It's not managed as you expected it to be managed. It's not in the form you expected, and it's dirtier than pig pen. And this is, and even if you think you have clean data, you have a lot of dirty data. And we actually, part of our roadmap actually included an entire separate band that focused on data analysis and cleanup. Because every single effort you go under, that's the challenge. Because it's, you know, you can spend a lot of time trying to work through rules to, f to correlate and figure out all this data, or you can try to clean it up the way you should have made it a while uh, when, when they started. So um, there was also a lot of doubt from different groups. So we talked to a lot of. Um, Geez, every different stakeholder, and they said, wow, it's a good idea, but you can't get done because we did it a couple years ago, and it failed. They don't, nobody will cooperate with you because they don't want to share their data. It's, it's very competitive. Uh, I don't have anybody to help do this, and I don't know what LDAP is, and, you know, leave me alone kind of thing. So a lot of discouragement, but, you know, we like banging our heads on the wall, and sometimes it actually breaks through. So we were running into some issues with each specific data source. One was, and probably the biggest challenge, was human resources. <coughs> Excuse me, one of the challenges is that it was outsourced, and it was actually uh, outsourced kind of twice. The network was, has, was outsourced within uh, management, it was outsourced within the CSA, as well as the actual uh, HR application. So it took us a long time, and in parents I have months, because it really did take months to get just a simple, what we consider a simple view of um, desired, the desired data. Uh, it went from everywhere from, geez, can we get a replicated table of data, because we know this table is a very consistent uh, view of information, to actually working down to, can you just give us a view of this, just a very core set of um, user information. And the reason we were so adamant with, with human resources is the organization had put out a mandate that they, or human resources was the authoritative source for X set of information. And so we, they're the source, we're bringing them in. The challenge was of course political and cultural. They had competing initiatives. They had their own provisioning effort. They had their own uh, effort for how they wanted to present the data to applications. So they own the data, but they didn't want to take the responsibility or the stewardship to actually create an interface for easy access for other applications. So they were very, uh, you know, I wouldn't say, they, they were cordial, but they weren't going to help us. But at the end of it, they were our best friends because, as you see, as we'll go through this, there's ways to make it work. The uh, telecom group was the help desk, and this is kind of funny. They were what I call a rogue project. So within the organization, they had architectural review boards and design review boards. You know, whenever you put a project in, you have to have it checked out and reviewed, et cetera. And they had a production review board, which kind of gave you a little st certification stamp whether or not you should go into production. Well, this telecom group ran their help desk, and they never really got it into production. So really, what, although it wasn't a, an officially sanctioned service, it was in production use, effectively. And they were, you know, and they you know, did all their support that way. They were also the authoritative source for contractors, because even though 
Uh, HR had no contractor information. Most contractors had a telephone, and they also got fed into the system. If you ever called for a, any sort of help, any IT help, you got stuck in that system, contractor or employee. So we needed them. They were very enthusiastic. They wanted to be part of this because they didn't want to have to keep rebuilding identity stores over and over again, and they wanted the consistent set of data to be able to be accessed for themselves. The last one was the corporate security group. They did badging. <coughs> they were a little bit of a challenge because they have a special implementation. It turns out that uh, Linnell, 96% of their implementations are on SQL Server, <coughs> excuse me, and only a few on Oracle. But of course, Oracle was the database that they had chosen because there was an architectural mandate that thou shalt use Oracle for all your databases, right? So the challenge was, where do I find the developer to create the customized view? And they came in and, and we found some guys and they got to work on it. It was interesting the challenge from the different cameras were used that were used over, you know, the years and years and years of. Uh, 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 they were in different sites. <coughs> we had pictures that were 640 by 480. We had pictures that were, you know, three megapixels. It was just an insane amount of different uh, sizes, and so we had to actually figure a way to make a standard size for those to be make it digestible by other applications. <coughs> Excuse me. So a little bit of um, my, one of our architects saw had a fun way of saying it's, you know, not, not all is sunshine and ice cream, right? Things are easy when they're going great, but when it's, it's tough, that's where kind of the rubber meets the road. No product is really perfect. We had um, some technical issues when we were implementing, uh, and we kind of pushed for things to be right. So if something was supposed to be LDAP v3 compliant, it's going to be LDAP, <laughs> LDAP v3 compliant, uh, you know, come hell, hell or high water. Um, how, how a company deals with this tells you more about them than anything else. Because we were not only dealing with Radiant, but we were dealing with other companies. And there's two options. One is setting yourself on fire, which um, if anybody is, remembers the movie uh, JoJo Dance of Your Life is Calling, uh, we used to, the term JoJo got used a lot because people would just, and, and groups and vendors would just kind of freak out a little bit when problems were encountered. Or you do the preferred method, which is to recognize the problem and figure out how to fix it. Right. And this is true not only with the vendors, but also with the, the different groups you work with. But it was uh, one of our challenges. And I have to say, Radiant did provide very good support. It was actually probably one of the um, differentiators, considering we were dealing with so many different other vendors on other projects. Um, they acknowledged issues, provide time tales to address it. And they left a very strong impression with not only ourselves, but with, with the CSA group. Because while it maybe things were not what, perfect, there was an, an attitude to address it and fix it. Which, again, in this world, that's, more, you know, that's, you know, that's, what only, that's all you can ask for. So the value that was realized out of this um, there's a sort of a build it and they will come perspective, because this is infrastructure. So people are thinking, well, if, you, if we build this service, we're going to encourage people to participate in it. And then as they participate, they'll be able to leverage the service, we'll be able to leverage their attributes, and it will be, um, it'll work well. And even if they didn't um, need the whole virtual directory and, and weren't able to use it to the extent we thought they would, they still needed it for other projects, our provisioning projects, our role-based access control project. We still needed the ability to get to different data sources and present them. So um, one thing we actually did is we were, uh, there were groups where they had their data, like they had a critical this, uh, sales and service system that was on, you know, very important compensation-related information on access database, right, sitting on some server. Um, we, we really wanted that data and other people wanted that data but we're not building connectors to access databases on servers. So we said, you know, the right thing to do, get that into SQL Server or get into a database, right? And so they said, yeah, it's great, but how do we do that? And so we kind of actually had to spearhead them to, you know, get up to kind of a standard level. They, so they migrated to an access project so they could look like access, but on the back end it's SQL Server, and then we can get to it and everybody else can get to it and everybody's very happy. So again, moving toward kind of these standards is, is a very helpful uh, model. We also uh, got a lot of questions on, well, what does this do for me? Because while an application developer might understand it, the 
other people that we'd have to justify this to would say, well, what does it do? So we made a little reference application, Super Wide Pages, we called it, because somebody stuck that name and it, it just stuck. Um, so we had employee contractor, accurate phone info, and their picture. And it wasn't pretty, but it worked. And people kind of got it once they saw it because they could see themselves update the information in, in their PeopleSoft and suddenly, boom, hey, the number's updated. Or the contractor called uh, help desk and they update their number and, whoa, I'm seeing the same number now. And the photos were great because actually there's a little bit of a biometric value to that. So you, you know, hey, that is Bob or that is Joe. and It clicks. And people started using this quite a bit because they, it became a very authoritative source for contacting these contractors, which of course there were 3,000 of them. Uh, and it got a little bit of a stir, so people said, hey, are you, you know, they talked to our sponsors and said, well, are you creating a, a, a new corporate phone book? And we already have one of those, and we've already, you know, dedicated XYZ project to go do that. And it's like, no, 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 this is just, just an example. But the point was that a lot of times they get bogged down in these, well, if you want us to provide this, this information to you, it's going to be this big project, and it's going to cost you this much, and there's, you know, there's a little bit of a shock value when you're able to show something like this that's, you know, relative, I'll say relatively cheap and, and quick. Um, because currently they're, they're, at the time their white pages was only like, only employees updating once a day may or may not be accurate kind of thing. The other thing is some of the subsequent phases we went through had some unexpected benefits in that we needed to, um, uh, in, in one case, put some, uh, information into AD. So obviously the virtual directory is more about pre pre presenting different slices, but you can do some sync services and such. Um, and we, one of the effects of that was getting the accurate phone numbers into AD. And we didn't think anything of it. It's just, hey, we're, we need this, we need it in for, it was actually a different key set of attributes, but phone number went along with it. And suddenly we got a lot of calls from people saying, hey, my Blackberry's up to date. I can see people's uh, phone numbers and their cell phone numbers because it was never something they weren't fully published and uh, it was people say this is really cool and we had no idea that this was an issue we figured out oh, it's just hooked up with exchange they got the right numbers it's fine it wasn't and uh, so the only people that didn't like that were the people who were who kind of keep their cell phones hidden or they hit they, they removed their numbers out of the system they didn't want people to know but uh, they were uncovered it was yeah too bad it's right so uh, A few parting thoughts as well were um, when people complain about what you're doing, it means you're successful. Right? And what I mean by that is um, uh, when an organization, this, this is a change of the way you work with people, it's the way data is presented, and when, if you're successful, they, you, you get feedback to when you're not being successful. So for example, the application developers, when this went live in production, they kind of expect their slice of data to be there, and that's great, it was there. Then a subsequent phase comes along and they're in development, and they don't see their virtual directory slice in uh, development. And they're knocking on the door, you know, where is it? And it's, it was never a, a funded service, it was never promoted, but they came back and said, no, we want that again. You know, please give us a refresh and, and make this into a, a, a managed service in the development environment for the organization, which was great. Um, there's a breaking of process sometimes that happens when identity information gets approached. Uh, every organization, a lot of groups think that they are the authoritative source for data, and they really aren't. Um, they also feel like they have presence over everybody else, and that is one thing that's not true. So if I'm an employee, my phone number comes from PeopleSoft, that takes precedence, right? But if I'm a contractor, my phone number comes from the help desk, it, that's the most recent source, that takes precedence. What happens when the contractor becomes an employee? Uh, that takes the, the employee one takes precedence. So again, you need to examine um, what the rules are, and at least I referred to this uh, uh, previously, the, the rules on how you uh, correlate that data and how you do your analysis as far as um, which attributes have precedence, what's the most important set of information, et cetera. Second point is give everybody else the credit. Um, make the owners of the data sources look good. And this is just, it, it, it you know, you don't, nobody needs the credit except them because at the end of the day, they're the ones that get called on about the data that they own. HR was very against us until 
we, may, we were able to provide an updated source of their data along with unique identifiers and unique IDs, et cetera, and they were our best friends because then we were helping their internal projects go faster. Um, they, uh, you know, we did that for, for e every group. And as a result, then they're more, not only are they more likely to work with you, but they also are more likely to convince other people that you're trying to tie in that, yes, this is good. This is not like those other IT projects. It's not like those other garbage went through before. These guys will work with you, and it'll be good, and, and kumbaya, and all that good stuff. Um, in, you, you should encourage as many people to uh, kind of come into the fold. So uh, like we mentioned with the sales and service group, they had data. They didn't have the expertise to pull their data into a standard uh, database form. We actually, our, our group provided the services for them to get there. And you sort of have to bring people to it because th th there's really nothing in it for them until they start to realize, oh, wow, if I, my data's here, then you'll populate the unique identifier that I need for the rest of the organization, right? And if something changes or that person's name changes, I don't need to ma manage that myself. And you know, as, you, as you know, people who do application development, you know, they, they get this. They get this loud and clear. Uh, also, the governance and operations components, those need to be in place. These things don't run themselves. Um, there's also a lot of uh, uh, decisions that need to be made at maybe a higher executive level that yeah. may affect this. Could you define governance? Okay. In the context of governance here, in this presentation, the management of the information, the, the information governance structure that who, who controls the information, who owns that information, how, who, who is allowed to make changes to that, and what are the processes for uh, presenting and providing that information within an organization. So for example, HR says, I want to provi I'll provide you, you know, name and work address, but not home address, unless you are of this, you know, somebody has, you know, the special approvals, et cetera, that kind of thing. Uh, and those are, those are pretty key because if you don't have that, you know, these things get put up and they kind of get stale after a while. So you need to have some, some ongoing governance and management, uh, which uh, in a lot of organizations there's like a directory services group that does this, but really more at a, a business information layer. And again, the whole point of this is to be able to quickly turn on a dime for the development of applications and services in your group. And I had actually scribbled a couple notes that I wanted to mention because I was listening to the previous uh, presentation. And uh, I think we touched on most of them here. Uh, yeah, I think that's, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Um, there was a comment I heard about uh, mergers and acquisitions. When you start to branch out and need to work with other groups, AAA, one of the things they do is they work with a lot of different affiliates. And so sometimes they want to bring those identities into the fold or they want to actually present a, a view of them. And that's actually one area where virtual directories are very good for bringing different disparate data sources together, um, especially if you're not quite at the point where you can go the, uh, the federation route. Again, that's depending on how, what the maturity level of your group organization is. And maturity, I mean by how long, how, where they are, not from a, from a infantile versus mature, mature, but from a, even though we work with a lot of infantile people, it's uh, where they are in as far as uh, their, uh, their, uh, their business processes. So I think that's it. I don't know what the, the time check is, but I have a question back there. And uh, the sources that you were dealing with, uh, how geographically spread out were they? Uh, we've heard some other examples where the you know, the sources are so spread out that they actually bring them together before they're virtualized. Were you going across land to get to the Yeah. Topic? So, all, let me go back to these. <coughs> PeopleSoft data was um, in Atlanta, and so we were going to, that was going to there. The Active Directory was in Sacramento. Uh, telecom was in San Francisco, badging was in San Francisco, and then over time the actual telecom moved to set their Sacramento data center. So they built, so everything, um, actually all these things were out of managed data centers. They shifted in where they were, the location of them. 
Uh, so the question is, how uh, how easily, when you do a virtual uh, virtualization, can you get to that data? You make a request. How long does it take to get that information and pull it back together? Um, in some cases, the caching can take care of that for you. In other cases, uh, uh, a database has put together that information, and then be just just for uh, from a redundancy perspective, and then have the virtual directory pull that information as necessary. Uh, it's also a good access control because one of the challenges um, you'll run into is if you want to bring data together and let's say in, in some form and stick in a database, then people say, well, give me access to it, give me a view to it. And that's actually like a juncture point where the virtual directory kind of sits on top of that and provides, no, how about we do this? Instead of you accessing that directly, we'll provide you the, the LDAP view and go to town. And that tends to work a little more effectively. So these were you know, different parts across the US. It was all going across uh, WAN. But they had a they have a pretty solid network infrastructure, so it wasn't much of as much of an issue. Um, but uh, you know, it, it, again, some places great networks, some places it's different. Scalability. This is a, a small implementation, but again, with today's hardware, uh, it, the, the scalability issues are usually not that big of a deal. <coughs> 